Welcome, Welcome to your online coffee break, where we discuss bite-sized topics that inspire, educate, and entertain. Here's your host, a software innovator, award-winning marketer, and astronomy and space buff, Chuck Fields. Hello, thanks for joining me today for your online coffee break. I'm so thrilled to announce my special guest for today, Jane Whelan of the Go-Go's. You know the Go-Go's, right? They had Fantine. I want to thank you. Thanks to you, we are now in 140 countries and all 50 U.S. states. So thank you very much for your support. We really do appreciate that. Also want to announce that uh, we're so pleased to be selected as a runner-up for the 2020 Podcast Awards from PopCon in the category of TV and film. So thank you for that. I would like to encourage you to subscribe if you haven't already. In addition to great guests like today's Jane Wheatland of the Go-Go's, we have some exciting guests coming up as well, including Kate Pearson of the B-52s, Fee Waybill of the Tubes, and even Jake Shimabrakuro, the famed ukulele sensation. So again, encourage you to subscribe today. Also want to say if you can rate us on your favorite podcast application, give us a five-star rating, we'd certainly appreciate that. And if you can, again, share this with a friend, we'd appreciate that as well. Now to our exciting interview with Jane Wheatland of the Go-Go's. As the first multi-platinum selling all-female band to play their own instruments, write their own songs, and soar to number one on the album charts, the Go-Go's are the most successful female rock band of all times. Band member Jane Wheatland has been there since the beginning, writing many of their songs and playing guitar. Jane joins us today to talk about the Go-Go's, plus their new documentary on Showtime, and their latest song, Club Zero. The first wave of punk was sort of dying. It was time for some new people to start doing something. Everybody was in a band. I mean, it was like the cool thing to be in a band, so we decided to do it too. Thinking about bands like the Shirelles and the Shangri-Las, it was exciting to think we could do the new version of that. But this time, we were going to play instruments. With one little problem. That we didn't know how to play instruments. <laughs> Online Coffee Break. I wanted to wish you a happy belated birthday. Thank you. Yeah, now I know this isn't going to air until like August, but still, that was just yesterday and I saw that come across and I was like, I have to wish you a birthday. That's a belated birthday. That's, That's awesome. sweet. Talk about the weirdest birthday ever. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, you can't really get out much and celebrate these days, can you? Well, this is really funny, though, because my boyfriend set up an, a Zoom surprise party for me. Awesome. And so the day before, on May 19th, I was getting all these texts from friends like, so what are you doing for your birthday? And I'm like, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I sound a little grumpy there, I, Jane. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I wasn't really, I don't know. I don't, I don't, it's not like I really care about parties, but I think just the idea that it couldn't have a party was kind of getting to me. So, yes. um, And then all of a sudden... You know, we were sitting there eating dinner, and he had his iPad out, and all of a sudden, like, his daughter called, and then my sister came in, and then all of a sudden, there was, like, 20 people on Zoom talking to me at once, wow. and it was, it was, That's so it was cool. very, it was really sweet. So, anyways, it ended up being a great birthday. The, the other funny thing that happened was we, we went for a hike yesterday out, um, near um the at the coast basically oh, and yeah. we were hiking up in the hills and when we got down the hill and back in the car with our dogs terrence my boyfriend discovered we were covered in ticks and our dogs were covered in ticks and i swear oh, to god no. i grew up in southern california and i'm used to ticks yeah. we i've counted 40 ticks <laughs> pulled off each of us so we no. were at 100, 160 ticks on the four of us and then I lost track of counting because it was just so freaking disgusting. So that was a super, I mean, I don't think I'll ever forget this birthday. I, I would have that way. stopped counting way before that. That's a crazy birthday. That's neat about the Zoom because, you know, making the best of a weird situation. But all those things, yeah. that's crazy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, so glad you could join us today. Really do appreciate it. I wanted to, before we talk about your incredible music, if I may, I wanted to geek out a bit. Didn't think you'd have a problem with this, but I thought I knew all about you and the Go Go's. But I, I really, I feel bad. I, I recently just learned how big of a Star Trek fan you are, and I didn't know this, but you, you were in uh, Star Trek Four: the, the Voyage Home. You had a little part I in there. Was. Can, I was. 
tell me, tell me about that. Tell me how big of a Trek fan you were growing up. You know, what do you like about Star uh, Trek? I, well, I was a little kid when the original Star Trek came on and yeah. my older brothers and sisters uh, discovered it right away. And then it became this huge family event every week where we would all sit down and, and watch Star Trek. And awesome. I mean, it really, it changed my whole life. It shaped my whole life. Really? Discovering science fiction at such an early age. It shaped everything about, you know, what I love. My my taste in, in design and fashion and stuff has always been, you know, yeah. because of that, it's been futuristic. And also my taste in men because I fell in love with Spock. So then I was always drawn to these like cerebral sort of distant kind of guys that had that kind of look. <laughs> so it really, That's really cool. weirdly... I mean, it's really weirdly, like, really influential on me <laughs> still. See, that had to be something because, you know, you were in the movie and I understand you were actually being directed. You know, Leonard Nimoy directed that movie. So oh. what was it like being directed by <laughs> Spock? What was that like? Oh, I was just completely starstruck and overwhelmed. And I mean, oh, I, yeah. I feel like when I when I see that movie now, I mean, literally I'm in it for five seconds, but I... Yeah. So look like a deer in the headlights because I was so intimidated <laughs> being directed by Spock. Um, wow. But really, honestly, it's definitely like one of the coolest things that ever happened to me. And uh, yeah, so very, very, very happy to be part of the Star Trek family. Well, that is just amazing. To not many people can claim that, and I'm a huge fan too of Star Trek. But you know, I'm obviously a big fan of the Go Go's too, and I I'm loving the new Showtime documentary. What I thought was interesting about it is, you know, not everyone knows how the Go-Go's were inspired by punk rock. So I want to kind of flash back to the mid-70s. You were in design college. You became inspired by punk rock. What drew you to it? You know, what was the L.A. punk scene like? Well, the interesting thing about the L.A. punk scene is that almost all of us that gravitated towards punk had formerly been into glitter and glam rock so mm. that was like you know david bowie and yeah. roxy music and sparks and you know nice. dozens and dozens of other amazing bands that were very uh visually oriented very influenced by art right. a lot of people came from art school and and um so it just that whole scene just morphed into the punk scene and I was just really attracted to the strikingness of the image and the, the rebellion aspect of it mm -hmm. and sort of the freedom, how people, I mean, music had gotten pretty overproduced, even with the bands that I love, but especially in the, the really popular bands, the mainstream popular bands, right. the production values were so high and people were spending so much money making records. And then all of a sudden you had punk rock, which is completely do it yourself yes. and, <laughs> and free and fun and right vibrant and crazy and yeah i mean that's i don't think it's any anything weird about that i felt i fell in love with it and then obviously yeah. the other girls in my band were also you know drawn to it and then we met each other and then the rest is history i, I thought another thing that was kind of neat is i know you you first learned to play guitar at just the age of 12 but that was kind of a just short little acoustic training can you tell us just about that a little bit yeah, well, when I was a kid in the summer, that you know, your parents would try and keep you busy and out of the house. So they would always have at the local parks, they'd have these um, little things where you could sign up for a class and it would be like, you know, six weeks and you would go and learn something. And so I chose acoustic guitar one summer and, you know, and I learned like Kumbaya and um, <laughs> Hang Down Your Head, Tom Dooley and like, you know, like yeah. <laughs> sort of really ridiculous classic folk guitar songs and and that was kind of the end of it for me and I didn't really like never really thought I could be a musician there weren't any female musicians that I knew about and it wasn't until the punk scene started that I realized n not only could anyone be a musician and start a band but even girls could do it so right that exactly. was, it was super exciting to discover that See, I think it's see too. And, and one thing, if I if I remember right, in the documentary it stated that when you started the band, none of the band members really knew how to play at first. Is that right? Yeah, we were really, especially uh, Belinda and I had never. Well, you know, Belinda was supposed to be in the Durance, but then she got mono and couldn't do it. But ah. yeah, we had this. Go Go's were our first band. I didn't, we didn't know what we were doing. I had never played an electric guitar. I didn't know how to work an amp. I didn't know what kind of instrument, um, you know, equipment to have. We were really starting from scratch in a big way. But luckily, like I said, the punk movement was super DIY. And 
nobody faulted us for it. In fact, people found it charming that we were so naive about music and being in a band. I think it's true because it, it gets you out of the box. You know, you had no restraints. You could just do whatever you wanted. Yeah, Charlotte, who joined just a few months into the band, who was a trained musician, I mean, she would right. always, it was such a compliment that she was kind of like impressed that I would come up with these super crazy chord progressions because I just didn't know any better. I didn't know, <laughs> yeah. you know, what group, because chords go in, a, in groups, you know, you yeah. get your, your G, your D, and your E, and your A, that all go together and stuff. But I was like all over the board, and I thought <laughs> the more chords, the better. So that the, the, some of those early songs are just nuts. See, I, I think that's just so awesome. And what I love, too, is when you were first starting out, you know, as things were starting to pick up a little bit, you toured England with Madness, Love Them, and the specials. But the reception, shall we say, wasn't really ideal. Can you have, just give us a glimpse of that tour? Well, the ska movement in England just started up really big um, around uh, 1979, 80. So yeah. it was about three years into the punk scene that some people branched off to ska and um, Madness and the specials were both really big in, in England by um, 79 and end of 79. So they had come over and put both of them separately, had played at the Whiskey mm -hmm. and had seen the Go-Go's and both bands just really thought we were great. That's so both awesome. of them invited us. Both of them invited to, to do tours with them. Um, and we thought, okay, so we can't make can't make it in America. We'll go to England and we'll be huge stars. So we get there and we get on these ska tours and their audiences, oh my God, their audiences hated us. Shame and, on them. You know, we talk, talk about it in the documentary where people would throw beer bottles at our heads and oh. we'd get spit on every night. And it was insane. But, you know, it was, wow, talk about School of Hard Knocks. I think it was really good for us. Like, we started getting really defiant and, you know, we were going to do this in spite of them. And yeah. by the end of that, yeah, by the end of that time and and plus we were sending letters home to our friends and family saying what big stars we were becoming which was not true <laughs> but so when we worked. got back we got this hero's welcome when we got back to hollywood and like we sold out the starwood which at the time was pretty much the biggest local venue you could play and there's like a line around the block and it was a big deal and i think it really it did nothing but good for us even though it was a super hard time you know, things changed. Like I said, you came back and things changed a lot when you toured as the opening band for the police. And I love this because I, I heard, you know, there was a point in the tour when your album, I think it was Beauty and the Beat, hit number one, surpassing the police. And I love how they responded. Can you tell us about that? Yeah. So we're talking a few years on from that. So we still came back and could not get a record deal and um, record companies point blank said we've never had a successful female band and there never will be so uh, thanks but no thanks right. we finally got a deal with miles copeland's brand new mini label it was like a boutique label or whatever and miles managed the police which is how we got the hookup to open for them mm -hmm. and we had already done at least two full american tours we were touring every day every day 300 days a year um first wow. a club tour and then like a tiny theater tour. And then Miles signed us and, um, no, I mean, Miles had already signed us, but he invited us to open for the police. So then all of a sudden we were playing these stadiums, which was crazy. Like we sold, we wow. played Madison Square Garden. And oh, wow. I mean, it was nuts. We were really lucky to get that tour. And um, yeah, the police were obviously in the charts. They were absolutely enormous mm -hmm. and our album ended up bypassing them and going to number one and wow. they came i don't even know if we were totally aware that it had happened but they came into our dressing room that night with champagne and congratulated us and it was just really sweet and touching that they did that what a nice reaction i, I love it how you have the support of the bands you know the police supported you uh, like i said madness the specials it's just amazing now obviously each of you have incredible talents I really am drawn to you know yours as a songwriter. You know you wrote several of the popular songs. You know our lips are sealed, and I know that you're an extremely creative person. But can you sort of tell us about your songwriting process? You know where do you get your inspiration? Inspiration. I have found that um, just taking in life experiences and being introspective, and also more than anything, trying as hard as I can just to be honest. That um, inspiration for me in the best of times just kind of falls into my brain. And if I'm there to catch it and to spit it out into a tape recorder or put lyrics down on paper, 
um, that's how it all begins for me. And then um, I find after the inspiration, then it's sort of the craftsmanship of songwriting happens where you really like beat the thing into shape with an, with a, you know, a Thor's hammer or whatever. <laughs> you know, like you flub it up and then, you know, it becomes a song. So it's kind of, it's a multi-part process of the initial inspiration, which I still find super magical. And I, I just don't really know how it happens. Sometimes I think, God, it doesn't even have anything to do with me except I was there and my brain happened to catch that idea. And hmm. so then you have, you have that, you have the craftsmanship, and then you have bringing it to the band. And, how, and obviously you can't discount the band adding their opinions and, and their style and, and right. their instrumentation to a song. And then, of course, you have the recording and the production, which is kind of the final thing. Well, well, let's talk about that because the go has just released your latest single, Club Zero. It's an awesome song. I love it. Thank you. You're welcome. I love how the documentary shows how the song sort of evolved, you know, was created and shaped. I just wondered, you know, what was it like for you, you know, back with the Go-Go's recording the, this first song in several years? Oh, and several. It's been a really, really, really long time. Right. Um, like decades. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, we had decided, God, we have this documentary being made about us. I mean, this is a perfect opportunity to, you know, have at least one new song. Come on, girls. Because, right. <laughs> uh, like, we're, we haven't been the most prolific band putting out albums. But, you know, we really love the albums we've had. So the thing is, we live in five different places. So that made it very challenging to write together. So all the writing was done, you know, over the phone and, and online and um. Many, you know, several songs got written by different groups of the band together. And it was a very, um, I was down in Mexico at the time. So I lived half the year in Mexico and half the year in the Bay Area. And mm -hmm. so, um, so I felt very inspired at that time and got a, a lot of stuff out, all of which I really love. But from the beginning, I just felt something with Club Zero. There was just something about it. So basically, I kind of got the song going, and then I, I brought Charlotte in, and then we brought Kathy in, and, and honestly, by the end of it, it was like, this is so good. It is. I'm so proud of the song, and I just so stand behind it and, and what it has to say and how it could show new people who the Go-Go's are. And, you know, I, I don't know. I, it's hard for me to restate how much it means to me. See, I love it too. And as the song says, you've got something to say. And and what I what I ask you now is, you know, the Go Go's were the first all female band to be successful, writing your own songs, playing your own instruments. You were the first all female rock band to get a number one album, and this hasn't happened since. So, mm -hmm. you know, what advice would you give to women out there who are in an all female band or thinking of starting one? Well, everybody when we're kids, pretty much everybody wants to be an astronaut or, a, you know, yeah. or a rock star. <laughs> so, and I think what happens is like the boys sort of move forward with the musicianship and, and for whatever reason, not as many girls do, but, and then the girls that do, a lot of them just want to be singers. And I get the, the glamour of just being a singer and maybe it looks easier because you don't have to learn to play an instrument and you don't have to write songs if you don't feel like it. But there's like just nothing more rewarding than creating your own content and being a part of it, a whole part of it, not just singing, but, you know, playing. And I don't know, I just, I just really recommend it. It's, it's a harder road, but it's a, I think it's a way more satisfying road. And also you get so much more control if you are that person, you know, like, mm -hmm. I look at, for example, Taylor Swift, who plays instruments and writes her own material, and obviously sings her own material, that how much more control over her career she's had than a lot of other young ladies. And I just think that it's a really good example of why it's a good idea. Oh, see, that's wonderful. Now, last question, if I may. You know, what's next for you? What's sort of coming up this fall? For me, um, you know, at this age, being in my 60s, that uh, my personal life, it's most of my life. And then the, the Go-Go's is a very small but meaningful part. So I'll go back to like rescuing animals, doing charity work. I recently took up painting, which sounds awesome. like so, well, you know, but my, my boyfriend's a painter and I've been watching him and feeling really jealous. Like, damn it, I should try it. And yeah. it's, I have a huge interior critic that's like, you suck, don't bother. This is not good enough. And I think 
for me, trying to paint has become one of these things where I'm going to fight that demon and fight that voice. So that's kind of what I'm working on as far as my character. See, I think that's awesome. And it's obviously worked out well for you. I think that's a lesson in life. A lot of us hold ourselves back and we can be our own worst enemy. But when you reach in and just pull out that passion inside and pull out that determination that you have, it's amazing what you had accomplished. And I, I just can't congratulate you and the band so much. Uh, the new documentary is wonderful. Club Zero is fantastic. I just want to wish you the, the best of luck for your career and your life. Thank you so much, Jane, for taking time to join us. Aww, thanks, Chuck. It was very lovely talking to you. Online Coffee Break. Well, I really enjoyed my conversation with Jane today, and I'm loving their new song, Club Zero, and of course, their documentary on Showtime. Highly encourage you to check that out. If you'd like to learn more about the Go-Go's, just go to their website at gogos.com. I want to thank Jane for taking time to join me today. I want to thank you also for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us. We certainly appreciate it. Again, encourage you to subscribe so you don't miss some of our exciting episodes coming up in the future. But I want to thank you for joining us. We'll see you next time. God bless.